the uh, famous theologian Karl Barth was noted for saying that the preacher should preach with the Bible in one hand and a newspaper in the other. Now, some weeks it's easy to ignore that advice, but then again, there are other weeks where it is almost impossible to not pay attention to what is happening in the newspapers and in the world around us. And, and, and this is one of those weeks, for as we all know, just a week ago, later after we had gone to come together to worship and praise the, the Lord, uh, uh, a lone gunman camped out in a hotel room in Las Vegas was training his sights on a huge crowd of people that were gathered for a music festival. And, and then at a certain time, once the music had begun, he began to fire from the broken window of his hotel room on the crowd about 1,200 feet away using what we believe to be was a semi-automatic rifle modified with something called a bump stock so that he could fire with almost the same rapidity as a, as a machine gun. And nine minutes later, nearly 60 people had lost their lives. There may still be more to come because there were over 500 injured, many of them grievously, as they were say, basically sitting ducks as he began to shoot. And I have to confess to you that I have had a very hard time getting past the images and sounds from this terrible shooting that happened just last Sunday. And uh, and they have preyed upon my imagination over and over again, and I suspect that may well be true for many of you as well. The monstrosity, the evil, the senselessness of this act has stunned us and broken our hearts, especially as we think about the, the terror that ha must have reigned in this crowded place as people sought a way to get out of the way of the bullets that were flying. And as we think about the heartbreak of, of parents and partners and family members of those who have been killed and wounded, and as we think about our own psyches as we, as we try to understand what it means to live in a country where these sorts of things seem to be happening with regularity and we ask ourselves is it even safe to go to a place where there is a crowd is it even safe to send our children to school is it even safe to leave our homes our anxiety is somehow heightened by the fact that up until now at least no motive for this hateful act of violence in Las Vegas has been uncovered and and it makes it just seem that much more random and senseless and therefore more terrifying. Now, as I was trying to prepare for the sermon, and I was, I was pondering particularly the gospel reading that we just heard, I have to say that the violence in Las Vegas pushed me to think about that reading a little differently than I would have had I've been preaching about this in another week or in some other time. It tells the story of a vineyard, this lesson, that seemed no more safe, at least for the people who were sent by the owner of the vineyard, than was that outdoor venue in Las Vegas. The, the story told by Jesus is a violent story just like what we experienced in Las Vegas, even though different circumstances. The violence of the tenants towards the servants that are sent by the owner, and, and then eventually the son sent by the owner. 
and the anticipated violence of the landlord in retribution, especially in the minds of the Pharisees who said, oh, these, these horrible people should die a miserable death. In light of the events in Las Vegas, my attention was drawn to the answer or the question that Jesus raises in verse 40. He says, well, now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those servants? And of course, he's referring to the tenants who beat and stoned and killed two sets of servants who came to collect the vineyard owner's due. And then who also murdered outright the owner's son and heir. And of course, hearing that story, the Pharisees respond to Jesus' question with no difficulty. They say the owner will put those wretches to a miserable death. And so even more violence there, right? And that is our instinct as human beings, isn't it? To, to answer violence with more violence. To think in the terms of an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. If you do me a wrong, I have the right to do you a wrong. If you hit me, I have the right to hit you back. If you wound me, I have the right to wound you. If you kill someone, the state has a right to kill you. That's how we think. Violence is the answer to violence. And, 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 and yet, on some level, we understand that more violence will only beget more violence. Whereas I believe it was Gandhi who said, an eye for an eye will leave the whole world blind. I have to admit that all the images of violence from Las Vegas seem only to be reinforced by the parable, leading one to draw the conclusion that there really isn't any alternative other than for there to be cycles of violence endlessly repeating one another. After all, what the parable is really about is the long history of religious violence told in the Bible. And as I shared when I was reading the parable, we're meant to remember the stories of the prophets that have been sent by God to Israel to, to give them a word from the Lord and how so often that word was met or the person bringing the word was met with violence and imprisonment and, and sometimes death. Just like in the parable for the servants. The servants that are first sent to collect the rent are meant to represent those prophets, and, and many of whom were rejected and imprisoned. And of course, as we said, the son of the owner who was sent to, to take care of business represents none other than Jesus himself, the one who was sent, as the Gospel of John puts it, he came unto his own, but his own did not receive him. So it is. We, we, we look at the world and we see, yes, this is the kind of world we live in. Not only is there something within humanity that makes a person capable of picking off innocent people from a Las Vegas hotel room or walking into a school done just 50 miles west of here to start killing innocent children. When not only do we live in that kind of world, but even worse than these random killings is the reality that there is something within the human spirit that causes people to love darkness more than light. And to lash out at the people whose only crime is to spread God's message of love and justice and compassion and hope. We live in a world that kills and stones and imprisons the prophets, that imprisons Nelson Mandela, that in cold blood assassinates Gandhi, that, that feels it necessary to gun down Martin Luther King in a Mammoth Memphis hotel balcony. And most evil, most demonic of all, we live in a world where religious leaders were so incapable of abiding the presence of Jesus that they had to wipe him out in the name of God. God have mercy on us. 
Somebody said, you know, men seldom do evil more cheerfully than when they do it for religious purposes. And one of the themes of Jesus in this parable and in so many others is that there is a form of religion that can actually take you much further away from God than bring you closer to Him. It's that there's a form of religion that if you lead to it, take it to its natural conclusion, will lead you to fly planes into buildings, to kill prophets, and to crucify Jesus over and over and over again. And think you were doing God a favor, and the world a favor when you do it. <coughs> And so it would be easy to conclude that this cycle of violence is just the way things are. That's the kind of world we live in. We don't really have any other, anything that we can really do about this. It's just the necessary things that people must go through in the world that we live in. But this morning I want us to hold on a moment before we throw up our hands in resignation. Because as soaked in blood as the Bible is, as drenched in violence Jesus' end was, as much as that trail of blood continues to trickle through our history and our experience, Jesus' parable and his life offer a different way. First, we want to notice that in the parable, the owner of the vineyard offers incredible grace and patience. Remember the way the story goes? Jesus says that the owner sends first a group of his servants, and they beat and stone and kill them. Now, the average person, if that happened to them, they would just hire some soldiers and they would just go wipe those people out. But not this owner. He sends another group of servants, hoping against hope that the vineyard workers would see the error of their ways. But no, they don't. They treat them exactly the same. And, and, then, and then most amazing of all, in God's patience, and his desire to reach out to the world in God's desire to, to be willing to go to any lengths to bring people back in relationship. He sends his son, his only begotten son. <clears throat> Who, of course, is killed on the spot. But remember that this is what the vineyard owner did over and over again and continues to do over and over again, reaching out to the world in mercy rather than in condemnation. That is the story of our faith. You see, this parable is really talking about God's patience with the people of Israel, his vineyard, how God continuously forgave them, continuously really reached out to them, continually sent them messengers and prophets. And, and then at last, how that same God sent his only begotten son, Jesus, who, like the others, bent with a violent end. You see, the parable seems to be headed in the same old direction, violence beginning more violence, with Jesus himself, the ultimate victim of violence, the crucifixion of the innocent son and heir, just like in the parable. But then all of a sudden, if you read the end of the story, not so much of this parable, but in the end of the story, the whole narrative changes. And a alternative to violence and hatred is offered to the world. Rather than return Violence for violence. In the cross of Jesus, God absorbs our violence and responds with life, with resurrection, with Jesus triumphant over death and offering not retribution, but peace. And the powers of evil are shaken to the very core. 
See, Jesus doesn't shrink from the sacrifice of the cross. He does not return with vengeance. He doesn't kick anyone out of the kingdom of heaven. He prays for those who are mocking and killing him. And after defeating death in the resurrection, having taken on the worst that our violence can inflict, comes back and instructs his disciples to take the good news of the gospel to the very ends of the earth, come what may, promising that whatever else happens, he will be with them always. So that they don't need to resort to violence or hatred. Because the story tells us that hatred and violence will not have the final word. That tragedy, death, and loss, and hatred are in the end no match for love and life and forgiveness and peace. And we may never discover what motivated the gunman in Las Vegas. And, and there's a lot of work to be done to take action on policies and procedures that will make our people safer, safer from gun violence and other forms of terrorism. But in the meantime, we have the promise that even when it looks like violence is the only outcome and response possible, it is not. Perhaps that's all the religious authorities in Jesus' time could imagine. Maybe it's all, it's, uh, maybe it, at times it's all our leaders can imagine, and it's perhaps sometimes even all we can imagine too. But there is another way forward. Jesus' example in his life and in his death and death and resurrection creates more possibilities than those we can see including the possibility of that long-deferred and long-for dream of peace where the lion will lay down with the lamb and swords will be turned into plowshares, no one hurting one another in all of God's mountain will become a reality. In the meantime, if we look hard enough, we see glimpses of what will we, it will be like when that dream finally does become true. You know, the newspapers and television news spend so much time on the killer, on tallying up the dead, on comparing this massacre with others as if it were some kind of competition. They, they endlessly show the name and face of the killer, making him a twisted kind of instant celebrity. And with all of that, it is so easy to overlook that whenever there is a tragedy of this sort, there are almost always more heroes than there are villains. Some of you might have seen the quote from Fred Rogers that I shared with the kids, but let me share with you in its full context. Because it was Mr. Rogers who said these things, I, I suspect his words were directed toward helping children cope with the bewildering sights and sounds they are sometimes confronted with. But as a 60-year-old man, they, they also helped me. He said, when I was a boy and I would see scary things in the news, my mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. To this day, especially in times of disaster, I remember my mother's words, and I'm always comforted by realizing that there are so many helpers, so many caring people in the world. And so in the midst of the horrors of Las Vegas, the helpers and the heroes were there too. And their stories are the ones that we need to pay attention to. There was the woman who stayed with a stranger while he was dying so that he would not have to die alone. There was the fellow who stole a truck to transport people to the hospital and then, then brought that stolen truck back to its owner. There was the young father who was shot in the neck while leading dozens of people to safety. And, and, and the man who died while shielding the body of his wife with a hail of bullets, from the hail of bullets. As followers of Jesus, that's our call to. To walk in the light as he is in on the light, to let our light shine in such a way as to overcome darkness, to render good for evil, to pray for our enemies, to love those who persecute us. And when we feel the desire to meet violence with violence and hatred with more hatred, as we certainly will, to resist the devil until he flees from us. 
Friends, will you be the blessed peacemakers that the world needs if we are ever going to wake up from this nightmare of violence? Will you be those people? Will you love your enemies and do good to those who are spiteful to you? Will you take up your cross and follow Jesus? Will you walk in the light as he is in the light? That's our choice. That's our call. That's what it means to tend the vineyard of God. To let our light so shine. I, I think I want to close by inviting us to sing a song together that probably know, all of us know by heart. And uh, Tom, if you can give me a starting line, you're, you're going to know this. I invite you to sing along. Let's say, Lord, I.